So just just this quick section here from Wretched of the Earth, and I think a good place to start. Uh, in the context of dealing with, as he says here, the high percentage of young people in underdeveloped countries that pose specific problems for the government that must be addressed lucidly from the perspective of the colonizer. He's talking about in the context of youth from the perspective of the colonizer needing to be kept from being idle. And so he's saying in the context of that, they talk of fortifying the soul, developing the body, and encouraging talent in sports. In our opinion, they should be wary of such ideas. In other words, African leadership in, in, in underdeveloped and newly decolonizing or un, you know, a community should be wary of that. Uh, and then he goes on to say here, the youth of Africa should not be oriented toward the stadiums, but toward the fields, the fields and the schools. The stadium is not an urban showpiece, but a rural space that is cleared, worked, and offered to the nation. The capitalist notion of sport is fundamentally different from that which should exist in an underdeveloped country. The African politician should not be concerned with producing professional sportsmen, but conscious individuals who also practice sports. If sports are not incorporated into the life of the nation, i.e. in the building of the nation, if we produce national sportsmen instead of conscious individuals, then sports will quickly be ruined by professionalism and commercialism. A sport should not be a game of entertainment or game should not be a game or entertainment for the urban bourgeoisie. Uh, so I'll stop there and bring Mutanda on as well. Welcome, Mutanda. Good to see you again. What's going on, guys? What's up? What's up? Mutanda, and again, Mutanda. I have so many questions and comments to 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 to, mm. to go from that. But I thought that when I was when I'm, well, I'll just start with the the, the next question that I have from that. There are so many colonial legacies still in, in football, and I'd like to get into some of the differences in, in terms of how Africans on the east, east of Africa have engaged versus the West Coast, which have its own colonial legacies. Uh, there's this new African described as a pan-African league on the continent, controlled, of course, by FIFA. But specifically, I thought I would ask this question. Given the colonial legacies and a little bit of what Fanon was talking about, who in today's nominally European world of football have their identity connected to that world only because of football. In other words, how many Africans playing in Europe were, are only there playing under the flag of, of their former colonial powers because of their ability to play football as opposed to being quote unquote regular citizens, et cetera, and so forth. Is there another is it maybe more directly, is there a how direct is that colonial pipeline extracting resources uh from the continent into Europe to play? I'll just and anywhere else you all want to go with that. You got an answer my hair? <laughs> yeah, it's, a good yeah, it's an interesting question. first of all, just a quick note on what we read from Fanon right there. Um Fanon is definitely dear to my heart. He uh he was practicing as a as a nurse uh, just 40 kilometers west of Algiers from where I am right here. And uh, and somebody that really became close to the Algerian revolution. And when he passed away, he, he wanted to be buried in Algeria. His kids have Algerian citizenship. So that's somebody that's, you know, we, we see streets here that are, you know, Boulevard France Fanon. So it's even lots of schools named after him. So always great to, to read and reread him. Um, and, and what he points out is actually something that's very fascinating because you see very quickly after independence some african politicians adopt the exact same stance where they say you know sport should be a sport for the mass it should be a sport where we're um really taking care of people's bodies and making them productive as opposed to a sport where uh, they become idolized and commercialized and become you know professional sportsmen and so for we'll have i'll give you two different examples so ahmed sekuture from guinea was somebody that was very much sport for the masses. You know, uh, we need to. At, at the beginning, the clubs were not even real sports clubs. They were not like franchises. They were not um, blah 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 football club. They were, you know, Guinea Conakry One District, Guinea Conakry Two. They were literally named after the districts and the neighborhoods. Um, Muammar Gaddafi, same thing. He has a chapter in his Green Book, the last. I think it's the last chapter of his Green Book about sports, and he says sports are great for those that are practicing them. But he thinks the people that are going to watch athletes play are really, really stupid. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah had another idea. Dr. Kwame Nkrumah really wants to use the Ghanaian national team, the Black Stars, 
as a tool of diplomatic and political clout. And he names them, you know, the Black Stars. That's the name of the national team. It's the only national team that has a Pan-African nickname, right? The Black Stars is after Marcus Garvey, who he knew quite well when he was studying in the States, uh, the, the Black Star shipping line. And he sees the national team as um, a way that he could spread his political message of unity. And, and and so as a result, he invests a lot into those players and he creates his own club called the Real Republicans uh, or nicknamed as OOC, Osajifo's own club. And and there they have a much more professional lifestyle um, and he's encouraging the development of quote unquote stars. So you have stars like Baba Yara playing in the 1960s. Um, who are at a level of fame that, you know, nobody else has on the continent and Ghana win the 63 and the 65 African Cup of Nations simply because of that investment. And Nkrumah takes African struggles to the international level. So the, the African nations will come together and they'll boycott the 1966 World Cup. They'll say, we're not going to even participate in qualifying until you give us a guaranteed place in the World Cup. Because prior to then, FIFA refused to give them even one single guaranteed place in the World Cup. So I think we had a divergence a bit. We had like the politicians that saw football as being sport for the masses used to develop your body. And when Secretary speaks at the stadium and gives speeches, he'll say, you know, your success demonstrates the success of our revolution and the vitality of our youth. It really is about, you know, like uh, health and vitality and strength of young peoples and product productivity of young peoples. You're a good sportsman because then that means you're going to be a good citizen after. And Nkrumah really has an appreciation for football as opposed to, and, and maybe Mutanda could speak about, you know, Kenneth Kaunda and, and his appreciation for football in Zambia as well. So I think there's a little bit of a divergence. And I think those are interesting things to see. But I think Fanon was much more in the, in the Sekuture uh, school of thought, in my opinion. Right on. Thanks for all of that. Yeah. Anybody want to add on? Got it? Got you know, I was I was gonna yeah. talk maybe about, or I was gonna ask a question. It's always fun when you have like people you can just kind of put the coin in the jukebox and just let them go. Like if if, if you could talk about kind of muscular Christianity, because that's the thing that I thought of when I read Fanon was like the 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 colonizer would bring football or just any sport really. It could be cricket. It could be anything, just to distract the people from actual revolutionary work and let's put that energy into sport yeah to, to be honest i haven't read much about the doctrine of muscular christianity apart from you know a few paragraphs for example in dr peter Alegi's book african soccer scapes and he talks about it as a doctrine of you know how was football and how was sport brought to the african continent that's not to say we didn't have different forms of sport prior to colonizers coming because we did you know other kinds of traditional games that maybe we don't see practice today or different kinds of martial arts that, again, are not as commercialized as, as what we see today. But football itself was brought over by the Europeans. And usually, initially, they were blue collar Europeans, you know, um, sailors, people that are, for example, in the Copper Belt in Zambia, there were a lot of railroad workers, you know, and they would come and they would, they would play within themselves, you know, in their own uh, complexes and their own little villages. And it was football for them for themselves. But you also had it brought over into Africa by missionary schools and missionary schools. We see this, you know, when they talk about colonization, they, colonization, they talk about a civilizing mission, you know, as if we were savages. And for many missionaries and priests, uh, they used football and they used sport in a way. They believe that if you had a good fit body, a good fit mind, you would have a good fit soul. Um, and here they, they're talking about a, specific, a strictly religious interpretation of good. They mean, you know, like if you are physically fit, you could be a good Christian. And I think there are similar doctrines even behind, you know, like institutions like the YMCA in the United States, you know, Young, Men, Young Men's Christian Association, if I'm not mistaken. Um, excuse the, the call to prayer here in Algiers that you might hear in the background. So, so. This was one of the ways that football was proliferated, really. And again, Kenneth Kaunda from Zambia, uh, you know, he's a deeply religious man, uh, the, the first president of Zambia. And he, his parents, I believe, uh, from not, they're not missionaries, but they were in the they were in the church and he grew up in the church. And he that's where he learned to play football. And that's where he learned to care about football. But what you see very quickly, you know, starting from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s on is that Africans take the game themselves. They, they appropriate the game themselves. And they use it for their own means. So you'll have um, Africans creating their own clubs uh, instead of, you know, joining the European clubs. I, I'll 
the, the example I'm most familiar with is in Algeria. In Algeria, we had a club, for example, called Galia FC. Galia FC is the Gauls. The Gauls is like, you know, uh, a tribe, a European tribe in France, you know, the Gauls. That's, that's what they call themselves. Uh, it's like uh, the Visigoths or the, you know, the Romans or whatever. And their logo was, you know, the French rooster, which is symbolic of France. It's like the American bald eagle. And that's the, that was the club, which means if you play for this club, you need to have a French identity. You know, you're most likely white. You're most likely of, of uh, French ancestry and so on and so forth. And in 1921, you have a club called Muludia of Algiers, which is Muludia is, is the, the Arabic name for, you know, like uh, the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. So this is an explicitly Muslim club in that sense. And when these two play together, it's like, <laughs> it's almost like a battle for the justification of colonization. Like who's going to win? Can the indigenous, can the, you know, the Muslims beat the French? And that could be a symbolic victory of colonization and so on and so forth. And so muscular Christianity is that doctrine. It's the, it was one of the ways in which Europeans brought the game onto the continent. But then you quickly see a reversal of those fortunes and you see Africans appropriate the games for themselves. And, and and use it in their own ways to express themselves and express their identity. I would just quickly add on to that. So I was in Uganda, November and December. So just for two, three weeks. And it's my first time there. So we were driving from Kampala to Kumi, which is maybe, I don't know the miles, but it's maybe like going from Atlanta to Charlotte or something like that. And one, one of the things you notice is saint thomas saint daniel saint robert saint saint everybody and there's a it's a, it's attached to a primary school and the idea is if it if it if if your school name is attached to catholicism or anything catholic people are more likely to send their children to that school so people make up these schools and attach saint to it and it is what it is but those are the places where i most saw while driving kids playing football and it it stuck also like when 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 you mentioned that or when I was reading about it, I was like, ah, oh, so that kind of makes sense. Like it's the 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 legacy of kind of Catholicism, Catholic schools, and how that's good for your kids, and also just African people just liking football. It it kind of goes together in that way. So I'll just tag that on. No, right on. Schools right are on. very much still the place where people practice football most, especially in East Africa and Southern mm. Africa. So they, they have a different kind of role in East and Southern Africa than uh, than Western and Northern. But, but Jared, what was your question again about the you, f f footballers so, playing for European nations having a uh, identifying with Europe on the basis of football? So I know I wasn't very clear, but but in my in my head, what I'm thinking is going mm. from from Fernand's point about the the attempt to impose sport on the colonized as a means of of suppressing them uh, and him wanting people to be clear about how we engage sport. Mm. I'm looking at today and and I'm thinking about the colonial extraction over time. So whether it's diamonds, coltan or athletes, mm. it seems like there are a lot of Africans in Europe playing for European clubs and I'm and I and I don't know to what extent and I was so I was curious about how many of them are there because of the the no, sort of quote unquote normal pathways of travel through colonialism where people just generally go to the metropoles of their colonizers as they look to advance and and come up or or to what extent are they more literally extracted as uh, uh, players early on, and they're and 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 again, their identities being shaped around their ability to play for those teams. Uh, mm. um, if, if I'm a little more clear there, if, I, yeah, if, if that I, makes sense. Uh, you yeah, know. yeah, that no, that would be a question for again. I think my head because he's based because if the I'm continent. not mistaken, like for instance, when I think about the, if if I'm not mistaken, the history of Mario Balotelli, there was some some. There's like this Ghanaian origin right. and then yeah, yeah. Uh, uh abandonment or something he's raised by italian something like w was that because he could play ball or was there some other relate relate colonial relationship or, or what was anyway that's, that's what so, yeah but go ahead that, yeah. no 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 that's a good question and i don't know enough about about balotelli's story um to give you an answer on that one but i definitely hear the distinction in the question now so i'll think about it <laughs> yeah there's right um 
there's uh, yeah every it's it's difficult to generalize because it's not, everybody has different stories and you know right um different paths but f- there's a player for example like Karim Benzema like Karim Benzema was born and raised in France but he'll say something like when I score goals I'm French when I don't score goals then I'm Algerian so and he's talking about the French public you know uh, meaning if if you score we consider you one of us if you're not any good then you're you're the Arab go back home you understand um there, there's some African players that will grow up and 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 on the continent and get their footballing education on the continent and then wait until they become senior players and switch to European nationalities for different reasons that could be um, that could be like financial incentive usually that's what it is that could be because they think that it's gonna benefit their club career um, there's so many different reasons why they do that. I would say that the vast majority, though, are not in that mold. The vast majority are actually like born and raised, like you say, in, you know, because th- that's the thing about colonization, right? It does create this pathway. You do have a lot of Congolese people in Belgium. You do have a lot of Algerians in France. You do have a lot of, uh, I don't know, uh, usually people, they, you know, there's sometimes like for, there are treaties, there are accords that are struck post independence that makes it easier for that population transfer to happen. And as a result, a lot there's that brain drain, you know, a lot of Africans end up going to Europe to to try and improve their, their, their lives, you know, their personal lives, their family lives and, and see if uh, if they can do that. And as a result, the kids, they grew up over there. And a lot of the times there's a conflict of interest because on one hand, the kid will feel, you know, at, at home, they have a certain identity. But then when it comes to their professional career, this hesitate and they say, uh, maybe I should play for the European club because that's better for my my pockets, really. That, and and this happens a lot, especially in North Africa, where that proximity is really is really, really short. Um, and, and it's an interesting discussion every single time. And it got it gets to a point now where people say, don't put pressure on these people just because they choose to represent, you know, a European country. That doesn't mean that they're not African. We can have, you know, two nationalities. You can have, you know, multiple identities. That's the world we live in these days. Um, but it's definitely an interesting discussion and, and it can get at times very ugly at times, you know, um, a lot of, you know, football supporters in African countries can start insulting them, you know, calling them traitors, uh, and so on and so forth. But it really is a case by case basis. Yeah, but, but, right but for, there, there's a few different, yeah. sorry to cut you off, but can I, no, I just, have, no, I just thought of one more thing. Mm-hmm. Now what we have, that's, I think very interesting is we have footballing academies because there's absolutely no doubt that Africa is like a gold mine for a lot of European clubs and European footballing institutions. We have a very, very young population on the continent. We have a population that absolutely loves football. We have very talented uh, kids that are playing as well. And so I'll give you a small example. There, there's an academy called Generation Foot in Senegal, in Dakar. Well, actually it's not in Dakar, it's outside of Dakar. Um, Generation Foot has produced some of the world's most f- famous footballers coming from Senegal. Players like Sadio Mane. Uh, right now, there's a guy at Tottenham. He's just 19 or 20. Pap Matar Sar. He's from Generation Foot as well. Uh, Ismail Sar currently playing at Marseille. There is no less than 15 to 20 professionals currently playing. A lot of them make up the, the bulk of the Senegalese national team that come through this academy. Now, how does this academy operate? The president of the academy goes and gets funds from France, from a, a, a club called FC Metz in France. Metz will say, okay, you know what? We'll build your infrastructure. We'll set up, you know, a little comp, a training complex. We'll build you two or three football pitches. We'll take care of all of your operating costs on one condition. As soon as a good player comes out of that academy, we got first dibs. Us. <laughs> Nobody else. It's, it's contractually obliged that... Generation Food has has the right of first refusal to any of those players. And so what happens is a player like Sadio Mane, again, we'll take him as an example. He goes from Dakar, or sorry, from <laughs> not Dakar, but outside of Dakar, straight to Mets for practically nothing, maybe 50000 maybe $100,000. And he, wow. what ends up happening is this French club will add something called a sell-on clause in the contract as well. So every time Mane is sell, sold, They'll make a percentage. It could be five percent. It could be ten. It could be twenty. It could be fifty. Forever on the negotiations. It, it's all in the negotiations. It can be for one contract, two two transfers. It could be for three transfers. Wow. It's really a case by case basis on that as well. 
And so what you'll have is that that French club, Metz, they've made a, a fortune. It's very, very profitable for them. The generation of Foot Academy isn't really complaining because on one hand, like, you know, uh, they're getting salaries, you know, they have a, a beautiful complex now. Uh, they also make a little bit of, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, drip by drip economics, uh, trickle down economics. They also get, you know, very minute percentages compared to the French club. But when you look at the margin of profits, the French club are making much, much, much more than the Senegalese one. And this is just one example. There are at least three or four examples like this of different academies on the African continent that we're seeing sprout up a little bit everywhere. Europeans are realizing that if we just give them just a little money, enough to build a little bit of infrastructure, they can produce the stars of tomorrow, and then we can clamp them, clamp down on them with the with these contracts that we're going to benefit off of them for years on end. It's beautiful. I mean, it, it, that's just beautiful. How how could I mean, it be any other way? A parallel would be would be okay. We're, you have a mine, a gold mine, or a diamond mine. This would, this would be an analogy. We're gonna build everything that you need to extract these you know rough materials out of the land. But then, as soon as you extract it, you're gonna give it to us. We're gonna process it and sell it for ten times its worth. That's the exact same really uh, analogy to me. Sounds and like then China. in perpetuity, sounds, like if, if sounds like China. If you, sorry, sorry. If you, no, 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 no. Just a, just, just, just a quick one bar. It, yeah, just, it, yeah. it, it, it sounds like China, but, you know. Because I'm saying it's like, cause, because what I'm hearing you say is it's it's that it's it's not only once the diamond, the particular diamond per se becomes worthy of, of, a, of a certain value. It's that if I buy, if, if I buy that diamond and then sell it, you still get a cut. You get a cut of that sale. And if they Absolutely. sell it again, you might get a cut of that sale. That's it's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. Smart I mean, business. Yeah, I mean, the but, colonialism is just. <laughs> <mwah>. <laughs> 